Hello, welcome to video 9 in the uh, PNS in 10 video series. This video is not going to involve a lot of playing, but uh, I will give you a few examples of what I want to talk about. The point of the video is to discuss some lessons from LIST. I've uh, highlighted just two for this particular video because I don't want to bombard you with lots of philosophical ideas. Uh, so we're going to focus on two. One of them is the uh, so-called sonic image uh, and combined with that I'm also going to talk about uh, uh, sources of inspiration and also the fact that you really should not mimic others because you don't share their personality. So I'm going to sort of dive into those a little bit in a little bit more detail uh, in this video. So first of all the sonic image and the sources of inspiration. What does it mean? Well Although you're a beginner at the moment, it doesn't mean that before long, very very soon, if you've been following the course correctly, you will be able to learn songs very quickly, and you will, uh, you you have, I hope, already mastered all twelve major scales. You can play in different keys, uh, you you understand some uh, chords, and it's all very exciting. And if, really, before long, you're going to be able to play some pieces of music, and you'll perhaps play them in public and. Uh, or just for family and friends, but people will be listening to them. And what is going to separate you from the rest of the pianists who don't think about these things is the fact that you have spent some time thinking about playing the piano, not just playing the piano, because playing the piano is almost 1% uh, fingers and 99% emotion. You know, once you've got your finger work sorted out, you need to remove the conscious thought, because conscious thought kills performance remember that. So in this video I'd like you to do a bit of thinking but in a way you can apply it to your actual playing. So this this sonic image idea, I can just give you a very simple example just to give you a visualization of what uh, Liszt meant when he talked in this way. Uh, there's a famous story by one of his students who tells of an event that happened in one of his master classes. One of the students was playing a Chopin piece and uh, one of the uh, powerful pieces um, and not one of the soft etudes but something with a bit more grit and uh, passion in it and she played some octave part very very quickly but she just played them very very quickly and Liszt said to her which was Liszt's common way of teaching with ideas rather than actually showing people what fingers to use because he, he, he as I have always felt myself, and I was very happy to discover that this felt the same way, that the, the fingers and the body follow the mind. So it's all, it, it starts in the mind first. Your, your, your fingers do not tell your mind what to do. Your mind subconsciously will tell your fingers what to do. And he said to her, I don't want to care. I, I don't care how quickly you can play your octaves. What I want to hear is the charging of the cavalry, the horses, as they charge into uh, against the enemy. So it was an image and what he's trying to get across to her and anyone listening is that you don't want to waste your time being able to play very uh, very quick octaves whatever the melody may have been but if you start to imagine the feeling that Chopin felt when he wrote the piece of music and if you imagine a stampede of horses charging at the enemy that's the sound that you want to get now if you do that it's going to give you your body is going to react in, that, in, a, in a special way. It's going to give you a lot more power, a bit more consistency, and you're going to think less consciously about what you're doing and more emotionally about what you're doing. So that's the idea of a sonic image. How can we apply sonic images to our playing when at this stage we only can play maybe one piece uh, and scales? The answer is simply learn lots of pieces to be able to apply this to. How do you do it? Well. When you're, it depends what music you're playing. If you're playing, uh, if you want to go in, into the jazz direction, and you're playing in a trio, it is, a, I admit, a little bit more difficult to present a sonic image because you've got the bass player doing his thing, the drummer doing his thing, maybe the guitar doing his thing, and uh, you're just simply playing your nice, your little improvisation lines at pretty much the same level of volume. You're playing. Uh, blue scales, you're, you're in a some way limited to what you can do. Uh, but if you're playing solo piano, you have a bit more choice, a bit more freedom, because you haven't got the strict uh, time 
of the drummer or the double bass player. But uh, especially when you're playing classical music or anything basically from the 19th century uh, and before, you want to, well especially the Romantic period from basically when Liszt was born in 1811 to when he died in 86, anything pretty much written in that time, uh, you need to understand the intentions of the composer and in any music after that period you need to, what is a very good idea, is to read the lyrics, the music that was written in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, uh, I would say up until then, most of the Cole Porter, George Gershwin stuff. There were some lovely, lovely pieces uh, written, and just by chance I have a piece of music on my music stand here, which is a, a very lovely piece. There's a lovely version online of this by Bill Evans, and the piece is called Like Someone in Love. It's this piece. It's just a simple melody with some nice chords. But if you read the lyrics to this, uh, it will enable you to really think about how to play how to play it by creating sonic images, which basically means that you're making other people see your music rather than just hear it. So, for example, the first line. Uh, this is a completely spontaneous uh, exercise, by the way. I've just noticed the piece of music. I like to improvise my videos. Uh, the first sentence is lately. I find myself out, outside, gazing at stars. And the second line, because it's a bit of a lovey song, is called hearing uh, guitars like someone in love. So it's a very romantic kind of song. But the first uh, lines, the first chords, if I just play the chords for you, I'm not going to explain what they are, I'm just going to play them so you can hear and feel what it sounds like. Second line. So it's quite nice chords. And if you want to play this in a very nice way, one way of doing it, apart from just finding different ways at random, is to take the lyrics from the piece of music, uh, lately I find myself out gazing at stars, and just begin to conjure up some images in your mind about as if you had written that sentence in your notebook and you're sitting on a hilltop looking at stars. You may be thinking about somebody that you uh, want or you, you miss or something like this and it might automatically, for me, my natural feeling right now is to go up the keyboard where the... up here start to come down. Like someone in love. And then I might play like someone in love in a very soft way. For example. And the idea is that you're you're using the image in your mind to dictate in a way how your fingers actually play the play the music. Uh, it's a little bit experimental for me at the moment in my own mind. But I think that in a way this could be applied to your major scale practice. Once your um, scales are absolutely in your fingers with, with um, no conscious thought, I think it might be worthwhile trying this experiment, which is to think of a time in your life, it could be romantic, it could be sad, it could be you know, disappointing or angry even, it could be something involving a lot of you know, frustration, it could be anything. And just see how you play the major scales differently uh, with both hands, eyes closed. And I think you'll be quite surprised how this mental exercise of thinking about a, a, a moment in your life and representing that just with a major scale. Uh, you may you may play it as uh, you may play the major scale with with its chord. So you may you know for, let's play E flat, for example. You know the E flat major seven chord. That sounds sad, romantic, longing. So you might think about some time that you were with somebody that you, you loved and uh, or something like this uh, or even a time when you 
regret something and it, you might play something in a minor key or play in a minor seventh chord uh, which is a bit which is sad but also softer your choice absolutely your choice or even bluesy and happy the day you propose to your wife or something like this anything and just see how that dictates how you naturally play the piano. This is part of your discovery to actually uh, learning what your musical personality is. And the more familiar you are with your musical personality, the better, more purposeful, honest pianist you will become. That already puts you above many, many, many pianists because they simply haven't done this. They just play from finger memory. And it's a shame because p playing the piano is much more than just finger memory. Uh, so, for example, let me just play this. Uh, well, let me let me play a major scale. If I just maybe play a, an octave major scale in E flat, if I'm just practicing this scale mindlessly, I'll just be doing this, which is not very exciting at all. But if I actually start to give it some life through this sonic image concept, I might think about. Uh, well, I don't know. I need to think about something now. Uh, well, uh, actually, one of my first compositions when I first moved to Budapest, where I am now, was um, in C minor, and it was... Oh yes, I'm just trying to remember the melody. So I'm playing C minor, and then this is an A minor 7 with a flat 5. I don't want to get into the chords too much, but just if you're interested. And then A flat major 7. And then G 7, but the 3rd is raised. When you raise a 3rd, the chord becomes a sus chord. Sus means suspended, and you are suspending the 4th 4 before it falls down again to a 3rd. It's just an easy chord. I'm playing a G 7 sus. It's quite a nice chord. It's a bit of a pop sound, a bit of an Elton John chord, as I call it. It's quite a nice sound. You have, have a little fiddle with that. And of course, learn, them, learn it in all the chords, in all the keys, going up D, E flat, etc. The quick way to play it is to simply just almost play the major triad and then just move your index finger or whatever finger it might be just up one semitone to the fourth uh, so if I'm to play A flat sus my fingers would sort of now they're thinking about A flat before they actually press and then just before I press it I just move up to that semitone that fourth it's quite a quick way to find it uh, so the beginning of my piece instantly right now I, I moved here in uh, February uh, at the beginning of February so one month ago almost to the day and it was probably actually, come to think of it, about this time when I bought this very keyboard and started to write that composition on this very keyboard. So come to think of it, right now as I'm speaking, and this is one reason I like to improvise my videos because I never know what's going to happen and it's much more authentic, uh, I, c I can actually remember how I felt when I first discovered this melody and that the... the uh, um, the nights were cold. The nights were cold when I was walking next to the River Danube. And um, what that should make you sort of conjure up is that my left hand represents the water and this when I came up with the melody in the right hand there was something cold about the water plus the fact it was you know beginning of March and it was about minus five outside and uh, there's something very I don't know for me that just sounded cold I don't know why it doesn't mean negative it just means cold
It has a tiny sound of majesticness which comes from the gold lights of all the buildings next to the uh, river. So for me that really does uh, sound again how I, I can feel now how I felt when I first wrote this piece of music. I was in another apartment uh, but not too far from here, just on the other side of the river. Uh, and uh, it's very, very interesting, really, how you can create, how that sonic image makes you play. If I were to play this just, uh, you know, in six months' time in the middle of the summer when it's 35 degrees outside, I probably wouldn't play it the same. I'd, I'd probably just... I'd probably just play it faster, probably. Or with no feeling. It would not be the same. Maybe I'll play it heavier. Whatever it is. Uh, but now, because I'm feeling it, and I'm going back to those cold nights, and I'm a little bit chilly now, I've got my, uh, my tea next to me, um, I, I'm playing it, it's actually affecting the way that I want to play that melody. So the sonic image is a really interesting idea. So what I was going to say originally about playing, uh, for example, an E-flat. Let's just play an E-flat major 7, which is my favourite key and my favourite chord type. Um, and I might just think about uh, missing somebody. So I might just... I don't know, there's just... When I'm, just, when I'm playing it and I start to move it around... I just feel a bit of a drain of energy, you know, I'm able to think of somebody and it just kind of affects the way I play that scale. I'm not even thinking about what fingers I'm playing. If I watch the video back, or if you watch the video back, you may notice that I alternate between my ring finger and my little finger on both hands, but honestly I have absolutely no idea what, because um, my eyes are closed. but it affects the way I play the scale. So the sonic image is a very interesting concept and it's something that I recommend that you give thought to within that previous uh, sort of 10 or 12, well, 15, Jesus, 15 minutes I've been talking. Um, I also included sources of inspiration and you can mix them together, but they're not exactly the same thing. The sonic image is actually trying to recreate an image as a sound but, and there are many, many opportunities to do this in the whole vast range of musical repertoire, but the sources of inspiration affects your whole being and dictates how you play a particular piece of music. Um, for example, there's a famous jazz song, a soft jazz song from the, I don't know when it was written, 30s or 40s, called Misty. And this was my granddad's uh, favourite piece of music. And it's one of the, it's actually the first piece I learned in the key of E flat. And uh, if I think about that song, and I think about those times with him, uh, and how he taught me the key of E flat and that song, that melody, uh, I can remember playing it to him, I can remember playing it to him in his house, um, on his uh, keyboard and recording it sometimes and he would listen to me playing it um, on his sofa.
so the memory came back of playing uh, there were certain things I did do and didn't do which I remember that he liked and didn't like so I did or didn't do them but if I were to play that to somebody else in, in 10 minutes uh, I'd play it in a completely different way and so sources of inspiration and sonic images really do affect the way that you uh, play music and you can even begin to implement this just by using it with your scales so yes excellent now the uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about uh, was mimicking others oh, don't do it there are millions and millions and millions and millions of pianists in the world and that simply means that there are millions and millions and millions and millions of ways to play the piano and not one of them is absolutely correct so don't worry you may prefer certain styles but what you need to realize is that the millions and millions and millions of pianists have millions and millions and millions of different preferences that I mean it's such a big mix it's such a vast vast playing field of styles and preferences and likes and dislikes that it's impossible and it's absolutely futile for you to think or feel or be worried about how you play and if it's right or wrong if you're playing honestly with a purpose nobody can take that away from you and it's very very important to not waste your time trying to mimic others having said that it is not wrong to learn how other people play and it's not wrong to steal little ideas from different sources but don't spend your time uh, completely trying to copy somebody else I'm just reminded of a story which is online by uh, Oscar Peterson when he's being interviewed uh, by I can't believe I cannot remember the name at this moment in time. It's, it's quite unbelievable. Oscar, uh, Andre Previn. Oscar Peterson, Andre Previn. Do a little search. It's a five or six part video. Uh, and he's being interviewed uh, in uh, England, I think, for the BBC. And Oscar Peterson shares a story. I, I don't know which part it is in, but I do recommend watching it all anyway. And you'll, you'll come across this story. But very, very basically, Oscar Peterson says that he was in Japan. He met a pianist who could play like uh, Art Tatum. If you don't know who Art Tatum is, um, just go and look on YouTube for uh, Art Tatum. <laughs> A-R-T-T-A-T-U-M, Art Tatum. And, uh, well, you'll, you'll understand. And this guy said that uh, he could play like Art Tatum, which is quite a claim. So Oscar Peterson went to meet him, and yeah, he was impressed when he could play this and that and the other. But then he asked him to play another particular piece, and at that particular moment in time, Art Tatum had not recorded onto record that piece of music. So the guy couldn't play it. And that's a very funny story, because it completely proves that this pianist was just making himself a carbon copy of somebody else. And when Oscar asked him to play something, he couldn't play it. If this guy had to interpret any other piece of music which was on paper um, in his own style, he wouldn't have one. But just think, he could have had a great, great style. If he, if he had uh, spent years trying to copy uh, Art Tatum's style, he obviously had developed some kind of finger power and ability. So if he had actually taken that and used it more beneficially in a more honest, purposeful uh, way, he could have actually become a really great pianist. He didn't. He doesn't say the name, so I don't know who it is. But the story still is true, and it, it carries weight to my point that uh, you shouldn't mimic others. You have to be personal and uh, honest and purposeful in your playing. It's very, very, very important. Um, I can't. There's nothing I can really play uh, in that way. But I suppose all I can say is, don't try to copy me. There's a very famous sentence by by Liszt also himself when he says that uh, he he was talking to some students uh, and he said that uh, you know you can learn from me and you can see what I do but don't try to copy me because you lack my personality so you know all the great pianists understood this they always want and I would like you to uh, not as a great pianist but as your you know advisor uh, to focus on yourself and discover what you like develop your musical personality and become acquainted with yourself as a mu as a musician and become a really purposeful pianist um, I have uh, not really copied another pianist 
but um, I have taken things and practiced and there's one particular lick that just completely comes to mind randomly as most things do um, when Diana Krall had her concert in Montreal at the Jazz Festival in I think 2004 I think it was 2004 2005 um, there's a DVD of this she has she has recorded the concert onto a DVD in Montreal and she plays uh, a piece called Love Me Like a Man and she does a great uh, left hand rhythm is it on the camera here? I'll, I'll do it up here but it is played one octave lower I don't have to fiddle with the camera because it might fall off the stand but um, this is middle C this is an octave below and she does it down here but all she's doing is doing C with G and C with A that kind of blues shuffle rhythm but she's doing it down here about this speed. Now what I learnt to do was I learnt a riff from her. So I haven't, st I've, I've stolen just a riff but I didn't, I don't actually necessarily use it when I'm playing. I mean I could but it taught me a rhythm technique and I now, uh, you know, in the past I, I used that You can change it, I can, I can do like, so I'm basically playing uh, B flat E and G you see seven. Oh, I can't do it. I'm thinking. Yeah, and then A, D, and F, and then G, B flat, C, E flat, which is actually C minor seven, or uh, just play the chord of C, which is inverted here, G, C, and E. So I learnt that rhythm from her because the camera looks down on top of her almost like this but completely from above uh, and another little riff I learnt from that particular song is in the key of F the same thing F and C F and D was a really good syncopated rhythm using these notes I've got the A on top which is the uh, third in F the C the fifth the dominant seven the E flat alternating with the D now that's a uh, it's a bit beyond the scope of this course, but this is a, a jazz chord. It's called a 13th. I have a video on that. It's a lovely sound. It's a jazz chord. And she's alternating on those chords, on the notes of that chord, rather. And she's doing it with that left hand shuffle, which I can now do. I can't do it when I'm talking. When I started doing that, I couldn't do that. I was, you know, I, 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 I just couldn't do it. My fingers were all being mixed up. Then I just close my eyes, feel it. So, you know, I stole those things from her and I just uh, put them into my little jazz bag and uh, you know, they're quite useful, but they, I use them as techniques so I could do the same thing in C. It's just a nice technique, you know, uh, for example. And of course from Liszt I learnt, uh, one thing I took from Liszt personally um, uh, is of course it's impossible to copy lists so it's not even worth discussion but one thing that I do like that he does is uh, the this kind of fast arpeggio I go up in one chord and come down in another chord and I do it in my uh, compositions sometimes there's one particular example where I go up in a C sus not with the seventh so C, F, which is the suspended fourth from the third, just the third up a fourth, up to the fourth, and then back down again, but I don't go down, I keep it suspended. So it's but then I come down on the C7 chord. So I go up and then down. 
one of my um, techniques, which I do, and uh, I quite like that. I heard that once in a list piece, so I thought it was quite interesting, so I stole that from him. But I'm not copying him, I'm not mimicking him. Mimicking him. One of my favourite jazz pianists at the moment is uh, a Hungarian guy who lives in Toronto. You can find him online, uh, called Robbie Botos. Boto well, in Hungarian it would be Botos. B O T O S. B O T O S. Uh, his first name is Robbie. R O B I. Uh, go and check him out. He's got a very, you know, kind of a really spacious kind of playing, and uh, I love it. He doesn't use the pedal a lot, which I like. And uh, I mean, I'm not going to copy him, but I do like some components of his playing. He really hits the blues notes, he's got a lot of space, he doesn't use a lot of pedal. I love it. It's, it's brilliant. Uh, Diana Krell uh, does a lot of uh, this kind of... She does a lot of chords and melody and octaves at the same time. That kind of thing. She does a lot of that kind of thing. But it's good, you know, you take different things that you like from different pianists from all over the place and uh, you, make, you add it to your musical personality. It's very, very exciting, very, very interesting. I'll leave you with that, and I'll look forward to seeing you in the final video, part 10, uh, when you are ready, when you've spent some time with your chords and major scales, just thinking about different events and seeing how you respond, your musical personality reacts and responds to sonic images, sources of inspiration, and maybe spend some time looking at videos and pianists, checking out Art Tatum, uh, Robbie Botos, some Diana Krall stuff, especially the live in Rio. Um, I'll put some links in the description and give you some good recommendations to get you going. Thanks for watching, nice little 30 minutes there, and uh, see you in video 10. Uh, think about maybe the uh, subscribe button, quite, uh, quite nice. All the best, see you soon, bye for now.